In our last lecture, we started talking about some of the factors that we should be considering when looking at stimulus control. And so we talked about sensory capacity and orientation, meaning that we were looking at whether the species that we were using in our experiment is physically capable of perceiving whatever it is that we're showing them, or getting them to listen to, or whatever it is. Um, and then also for orientation, that they're actually facing in the correct direction so that they can actually see the stimuli that they're being presented with. And I included the example of having our chickadees sit in a location where we knew that they could actually hear the stimulus that they were being presented with. So the orientation doesn't just have to be for visual stimuli, it can be for all different kinds of stimuli. You just want to set stuff up so that you know, or can at least be a little bit more certain, that they're paying attention and are at, uh, pr uh, presented with the stimuli that you want them to be presented with. Today we're going to continue on and talk about how stimulus control can depend on other stimuli involved in a particular situation. So specifically, we're going to be looking at overshadowing. And overshadowing is the interference of conditioning, uh, sorry, interference with conditioning of a stimulus because of the simultaneous presence of another stimulus that is easier to condition. This is saying that if we have two or more stimuli that are being present, presented at the same time, then not all of them will necessarily be encoded equally. Some of them may be more attention getting or easier to associate with whatever task is ongoing. So some stimulus might be easier to condition, which means that we're going to learn less about those stimuli that are harder to learn about, that are harder to condition. So the presence of other stimuli can affect what we learn and how we learn about other stimuli. In these situations, we could say that there is competition among stimuli for access to learning processes. We basically only have enough brain capacity and we're going to focus on learning the most about the things that are easiest to learn about. So saying this, we're uh, making the statement that having our necessary sense organs to detect the stimulus and being oriented towards the stimulus and being in the presence of a particular stimulus isn't sufficient to guarantee that the organism's behavior will come under the control of that stimulus. There's still more that we need to consider. And as a general rule of thumb, uh, the higher the intensity stimulus, the more easily conditioned it is. So something that is more salient, more attention grabbing, it's going to be easier to learn about that stimulus than something that is less attention grabbing. And the textbook uses the example of teaching a child to read using a picture book. The hope being that you are teaching the child the words at the bottom of the page. But the pictures with their bright colors and their cute drawings might be more salient. They might be more attention grabbing. And so the child might only pay attention to the pictures and learn the, the words out loud that go along with the pictures, but never pay enough attention to the words to actually learn the words on paper that go with the words that are spoken. So a more attention grabbing or higher intensity stimulus can take away from your ability to learn a lower intensity or less easy to learn stimulus. Now again, the textbook has some really good examples of overshadowing, um, and they walk you through a couple of different experiments there, but I figure you can read the textbook, you can look at those experiments, um, you don't necessarily need me to explain them to you again and again. So let's talk about some different experiments that illustrate the same basic concepts. So instead of doing the exact same thing over again, let's look at some new examples and some really cool research. So we're going to start with a simple overshadowing of tones by light. So this is an experiment where pigeons were trained to peck in uh, to peck a key in an operant box whenever a 1000 kilohertz tone is played. So when this tone is present, then pecking that key should be reinforced with food. There were two groups of pigeons, ones that were trained with a lighted key. So the key that they had to peck was also lit up. So in their situation, the 1000 hertz tone was playing and the light uh, 
was lit behind a key, and when they pecked, they would get food. The other group was trained in the dark, so they didn't have an illuminated key, they didn't have a visual cue, they just had that 1000 hertz tone. And the graphs over here show individual data for a bunch of different pigeons, and these are meant to be generalization curves. So in the middle here, we have a one kilohertz frequency, which is the 1000 hertz tone that they were trained on. And uh, they would go uh, frequencies that were slightly lower and slightly higher to see what their responding looked like when we shifted to, um, oh boy, words are hard today. Um, so we're looking at shifting that one feature, the frequency of the tone, to see how responding changed as we modulate that one frequency. So for the pigeons that were trained with a lighted key, we see a pretty much flat curve here. There's maybe a little bit more responding at that one kilohertz mark that they were originally trained on, but this is a very, very shallow, if not flat, generalization curve. Whereas the pigeons that were trained in the dark with no visual cues show higher responding at the frequency that they were trained to respond at, and they see less responding to either side. So these ones are showing that they actually learned to relate that tone to that behavior. So in their situation, their behavior came under stimulus control of the tone. Whereas in our lighted key group, the presence of a more salient light cue ended up overshadowing what they learned about the tone. So the presence of the light overshadowed tones and they didn't really learn that much about the tone because of interference from the lights. Now, most of the research that tends to get discussed when we're looking at overshadowing tends to focus on things like lights and tones, maybe even some smells, but the experiments in the textbook are fairly straightforward and they follow the normal operant conditioning paradigms that we've seen so far. So I thought I'd take a moment to detour just a little bit, and we're going to talk about overshadowing in a completely different setup, which is landmark learning. So we're going to bring in a little bit of spatial navigation, which is a really cool topic. And this is actually research that was done by someone at the U of A. So this is Mircea Spech's work. Um, and we've seen quite a bit of her work looking at things ranging from gambling, gambling behaviors in undergraduates and pigeons to navigation in pigeons, undergraduates, and even ants. Um, so it's kind of nice to be able to bring in some, uh, some people that we know into the topics of the course. And this is also going to serve to prime us for a topic that we're going to talk about a little bit later on in this course, which is navigation, which I believe comes up in chapter 11. But when we're navigating, when we're moving through our three-dimensional environments, in order to get around properly, we use things like beacons, landmarks, and other spatial cues. And the presence of different kinds of cues can actually show the same overshadowing principles that we've been talking about. So in this setup, they ran the same experiment in both pigeons and undergraduates, and they used a touchscreen task to understand or study landmark learning. So this experiment was set up to test for stimulus control of landmarks and to look for potential other factors that might control overshadowing. So let's look at this actual experimental setup. So what this experiment would look like is that we have a touch screen and on that screen we'd be shown a couple of landmarks and based on those landmarks the participants, whether they be pigeons or humans, would get reinforced if they pecked or touched this white square in the middle. That white square is our goal location. So the goal here was to locate and remember that position. So during training, you could be shown the square, but afterwards they would leave that space blank and you'd have to remember where the goal location was relative to the other cues, relative to the other landmarks that were given to you. In these conditions here, these would be overshadow conditions. So we would have these OV or overshadow landmarks, and these always appeared with two other landmarks. 
and the idea with these overshadow landmarks was that the presence of some other landmark would be expected to overshadow our learning of this particular OV landmark. So here we have a far landmark, which is far enough away that it shouldn't overshadow. And then we have a close landmark, the CL, that should be closer to our goal location and that might overshadow what we learn about this OV landmark. For our non-overshadow groups, we would have a non-overshadow landmark the little triangle thing here. And this landmark only appeared with one other landmark type, and that's the far landmark. And the way that we tend to encode spatial information is that stuff that is closer to whatever we're trying to learn tends to be considered more important and we tend to learn more about it. So the idea here is that in this situation, this far landmark is less important, so we should only learn about the really close non-overshadowed landmark. But in this situation, the overshadowed landmark is fairly close, but there's also a competing close landmark that is also close. So instead of just learning about this one landmark, you'd split what you learn between the two and theoretically be less reliable. Okay. So the process would be that they train them up on these training trials where they have all three or both of their landmarks. And then we would enter into testing trials to see what they had learned about individual landmarks. So if presented with only the overshadowed landmark, how accurate were the participants in locating that goal box? If they had only been presented with the non-overshadowed landmark, how accurate were they in finding that goal box? And so I can switch back and forth here so that you can see the training included all of the landmarks and the testing removed all but our overshadow and not overshadowed landmark. And we can look at our accuracy here. So this is proportion in goal, which is just how accurate were they at touching the goal location. And our non-overshadowed landmark, they were much more accurate, significantly more accurate in fact. So having that close landmark here during the learning trials ended up overshadowing what they could learn about the overshadowed landmark. So they saw what they anticipated to see. And as something really cool, they ended up actually taking their data because when they're using touch screens, they can get a uh, two-dimensional map of where people were and pigeons were touching or pecking. And so this graph here is basically the horizontal and vertical. So it would be like we were putting um, an axis along the horizontal and along the vertical here to look at where they're pecking. So this uh, outline would be the goal location. Um, so the broader these peaks are, the less accurate the selection is, the less accurate the pecking or touching the screen would be. And so both of these are individual data for two of the birds. So in these cases, it would be pecking. And the closer to that zero, zero of the X in the middle, the more accurate they are. So these pigeons were actually fairly accurate, and this was for the non-overshadowed data. And then if we look at the overshadow data, so this type of trial to go along with this bar, the same pigeons, we see that the peaks are much lower and they're a lot broader at the base, meaning that they were much less accurate, which just shows us in three dimensions what this bar was telling us. But it's kind of neat to also see this here to show how much pecking and where the pecking was happening. And just quickly, we can look at uh, the human data in comparison. So what we saw previously was pigeon data. The human data looks identical. Um, which is really, really cool. A little bit more accurate if we compare the um, units on the axis. So here, humans could be as accurate as almost 0.6 of proportion in the goal, whereas pigeons were only up to like 0.35. But still, the difference between the two bars is pretty much the same, which is kind of cool that we can see that comparatively between the two species. Next, we're gonna talk about compound stimuli. Specifically, how do animals treat compound stimuli? And up to this point, we've pretty much spoken about the fact that compound stimuli are 
made up of components that are distinct and separate. So our circle with a triangle compound stimulus that pigeons were pecking at was considered as either a circle or as a triangle where the pigeons could encode information about one component or the other component that made up that compound stimulus. And this idea of treating the two components that make up these compound stimuli as distinct and separate is called the uh, stimulus element approach. So uh, this says that organisms treat stimulus elements as distinct and separate features of the environment. And we use that explanation when talking about overshadowing. So when we were talking about our light and tone in pigeons that were being trained to peck, we talked about light as a component, as an element of that stimulus, and the tone as another element of that stimulus. But this isn't the only way to consider compound stimuli. We could instead use a configural cue approach, and this assumes that the organisms treat the stimuli as integrated wholes. So instead of uh, the tone and the light being separate and distinct elements, maybe them together are treated as a single unified whole. This approach assumes that the animal might not be able to identify the elements that make up that compound stimulus when the compound cue itself is not present. So in this way, if we were talking about a tone and light, then they would learn only about the tone and light together. Maybe they don't learn anything about the tone, and maybe they don't learn anything about the light when they are standalone units. We might say that the organism pays attention to the compound as a whole and considers that compound stimulus a unique configuration that is separate and distinct from either of the elements on their own. If this were the case, if you had trained an animal using a compound stimulus and then try and present the individual elements, their behavior might not generalize to the single element. They might not respond to that single element the way that they did to the compound stimulus. So this might be what's responsible for the overshadowing effect. And so if we wanted to interpret one of the other examples that we've just talked about in terms of stimulus element approach versus configural cue approach, we can look at our landmark experiment that we just discussed. We could say that our results that we observed when testing our overshadowed stimulus versus non-overshadowed stimulus, which if you remember back just a couple of slides, looked something like this, where they responded more accurately to the non-overshadowed training situation, and they responded less accurately to this overshadowed situation. Um, the fact that they were able to respond at all in this overshadowed condition when they had learned about a this location from a compound stimulus from both the overshadowed and the close landmarks that were here and both considered very close and therefore very salient cues, we still see some responding to the overshadowed stimulus alone. So when we tested with only one of the two relevant landmarks, we still see some responding, which is why this is consi uh, consistent with that stimulus element approach, because both elements were encoded. Both We learned something about both elements in this situation. If, in contrast, this was the configural cue approach, we would expect pretty much no responding to just the overshadowed landmark on its own, because if we learned about the compound stimulus as something separate and not made up of individual elements, then presenting one element shouldn't mean anything to that organism. So our data would have looked much different if we had a configural cue set up here. Now, neither of these is sort of considered the most correct situation. There are actually studies that when set up properly can show a configural cue approach, um, but the ones that we've talked about so far have all pretty well lined up with our stimulus element approach. The textbook talks about the fact that both of these approaches can be considered valid depending on the situation, and that a better 
view would be something that somehow manages to incorporate both approaches, but at this point in time, nobody can agree on how to do that. So we talk about both approaches separately, but as per usual, neither of them is more correct or less correct. It's all going to depend on the situation. Um, so just to make us aware that these two options exist, even though we've mostly been focusing on the stimulus element approach so far. This next slide is going to be another example of ease of conditioning that isn't related to overshadow. So even when stimuli aren't presented as a compound stimulus, like in our overshadowing examples, the nature of the stimulus itself can influence how well we learn about it. So some stimuli are more easily used as discriminative stimuli than others. For example, when we work with our songbirds, they learn much, much faster if we use natural stimuli than if we use synthetic stimuli. So over here, we have a, uh, a spectrogram showing their Phoebe song. Um, the graph itself doesn't really matter. This is just a visual representation of what their song sounds like. And these guys are really, really quick at learning these songs because it's biologically relevant. It's involved in their mating behavior. It's involved in um, finding a mate, defending their territory, chasing off threats, all sorts of things. So they learn to discriminate these very, very quickly. We in the lab have done experiments where we use a synthetic version of this song. And the more synthetic the equivalent is, the more we use, say, a tone instead of these fuzzy lines here. If we used uh, something that looked like a flat line and then a flat line, they learn that a lot slower. And if we lose the biologically relevant cues, like say the difference in frequency from the first note to the second note, if we changed that, and instead of maintaining the like nice ratio that we have here, if we remove that entirely and just gave them two flat tones, they would learn that even slower. So the more biologically relevant a stimulus is for chickadees, the faster they learn it, and the more uh, synthetic it is, the more fake it is, the slower they learn it. And in different species, there are different examples of this where, for whatever reason, certain types of stimuli are just harder for them to learn. So it's always a good idea to make note of what species you're using and maybe look into what things are relevant to them and not relevant to them if you're ever setting up an experiment like this. Moving down our list of factors, we're going to talk next about the type of reinforcement that's being used. So degree of stimulus control or how much stimulus control we can train can also depend on the type of reinforcement that's being used. St some stimuli work better when contingent with positive reinforcement, others work better with negative reinforcement, and we've kind of touched on a similar topic earlier in the class where there are certain stimuli that tend to pair better, better with other conditions. So we talked about our rats with their bright, tasty water and where it was a lot easier to associate a taste if the bad outcome was getting sick. Um, and it was a lot easier to associate a light with a foot shock. So the light was easily associated with something environmental and a taste is associated with something with sickness. So the nature of what's being used as reinforcement, whether it's an appetitive or aversive stimulus, um, can affect what stimuli more easily associate with it. So the foot shock and uh, sickness are examples of aversive stimuli. So that would be stimuli that are uh, unpleasant or bad in some way. But the textbook uses another example, which is looking at uh, positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement. So one group were given a compound stimulus, a light and a tone. They had to make the operant response of pressing a pedal, and if they press the pedal when that light and tone compound stimulus was present, they would get food, so positive reinforcement. 
The second group was trained with the same light and tone compound stimulus. They had to make the same operant response. They had to press the same pedal, but their outcome was to avoid a shock. So this is negative reinforcement. And so after training, we can look at our graph over here where our group one was the food reinforcer, that's our positive reinforcement. Group two is the shock avoidance, that's the negative reinforcement. And the red bars are our tone and light compound stimulus. So we see that they learned to press the pedal quite a bit. So our axis here is pedal, pes pedal presses, which means that the higher the bar, the more they're doing the inferent behavior. So they test the compound stimulus, and then they tested each of the individual tones or each individual component separately. So the light and the tone. And they found that group one with the food reinforcer would press the pedal more when there was a light present, but they didn't press it very much when the tone was present. So because of the delivery of food, they assumed that the light was responsible, was the important part of that compound stimulus, and so they would press the pedal when the light was present, but they did not press the pedal when the tone was present. In contrast, the shock avoidance group ended up pressing the pedal more when the tone was presented than when the light was presented. So the tone was deemed the more relevant stimulus in that situation. Um, they still responded a little bit to the light here, um, even more than on this side with the tone. Um, but we do see sort of that shift where they paid more attention to the tone when the reinforcer was the avoidance of shock. And here they pay more attention to the light when the reinforcer is the delivery of food. So the type of reinforcer being used will influence what they learn about a compound stimulus. So this tells us that light is easier to learn about when it's associated with food, and a tone is easier to learn about when it's associated with avoiding shock. And we can link this to our idea of belongingness and behavioral systems. So the food activated feeding system might tell us that visual cues go with food of most uh, most of the species these kinds of studies are done in search for food using their eyes whereas our shock activated defense system tells us that auditory cues go with predators well, we could look at other species. Maybe you look for a species that doesn't use visual cues for food. Maybe they hunt with auditory cues. Or maybe they only use olfactory cues. So we could see different results in different species based on what they use to look for food or what they associate with predators. Um, so lots and lots of possibilities there. All right. And so we did our type of reinforcement. Now let's talk about the type of response. Um, we've mostly talked about pressing a pedal, pecking a touch screen, uh, pulling a lever, pecking a key. Those are all different kinds of responses. But we can say that the nature of the response that's required to receive reinforcement can also affect stimulus control. So let's look at another experiment. And this one is a really cool experiment. I like how it's a very elegant way for us to look at a whole bunch of different factors that might be involved in stimulus control. So this is the quality location effect experiment. And this was originally done in the 60s. And this is pretty uh, a pretty standard experiment to talk about when we're doing uh, behavioral and learning stuff. So in this situation, we're going to manipulate two different factors of our stimulus. So we can have the location of the stimulus. It can be presented either in front of or behind the animal. And we can have the quality of the stimulus. Is it a metronome or is it a buzzer? So two different types of auditory stimuli, and they can occur in front of or behind the animal. And so we can ask which of these two features, the quality or the location, would control the behavior. So we can have group one, which is set up as a right-left discrimination. So they had to either raise their right leg or raise their left leg as their front response. So they would have, um, we're going to present one of the options in any good experiment. They would randomize this to control for any other confounds. We're going to talk about just one 
uh, situation of this because it can get really complicated really quickly, but we would say that they have the metronome in front, and if they hear the metronome in the front, they're supposed to raise their right leg. Then they would have the buzzer behind them, and if they hear the buzzer from behind, they're supposed to raise their left leg. And if I didn't mention it, or if it isn't clear from the image, this was done with dogs. They had a different group that instead of tra being trained on this right-left discrimination, they were trained on a go-no-go no go discrimination. So if they hear the metronome in front of them, same location, just for ease of understanding, the response that they should make is a no-go response, so do not raise a leg. But if they hear the buzzer behind them, they should make a go response. They should raise a leg. So we have two different kinds of responses. Here we have to discriminate between raising the left or the right, and here they needed to discriminate whether they should raise their leg or not raise their leg. So these are two very different kinds of responses. Now this was our training setup. So after this training setup, they decided to test which feature was important. So if they were trained with the buzzer behind and the metronome in front, what happened if they were then presented with the metronome behind and the buzzer in front? Would this dog uh, raise the left leg for a sound that was behind them? Or would they raise a right leg if they hear a metronome? To walk through the options, because I feel like I'm going to confuse myself, I want to say, okay, so this was our training setup. For our testing, we switch it. So the metronome is behind and the buzzer is in front. So if they're paying attention to the location of the stimulus, anything that they hear behind them, whether it's buzzer or metronome, should involve raising the left leg. So location says raise the left leg if you hear something behind you, raise the right leg if you hear something in front of you, regardless of what the stimulus is. If they're paying attention to the quality of the stimulus, then if they hear the metronome, even if it's behind them, hearing the metronome tells them to raise their right leg. And if they hear the buzzer, no matter of its location, buzzer means left leg. Um, so we can see based on how these two groups respond to those moved stimuli when we reverse our conditions, what kinds of behaviors do we see? And what we happen to see is that for the left-right discrimination group, they care about the location of the response. So in this left-right discrimination group, if it's behind, then it's uh, a left response, and if it's in front, then it's a right response. So the location of response matters for a left-right discrimination. But this isn't always the case. For our go-no-go no -go group, they cared about the quality of the response. So if they heard the buzzer, um, which is another B, so let's put a Z there. So if they hear the buzzer, no matter where that buzzer is, whether it's in front of them or behind them, they're going to go. And if they hear the metronome, whether it's in front of or behind them, they're going to no-go. So when it's a go-no-go no -go response, they care about quality. And if it's a left-right discrimination, they care about the location. So the type of response that they need to make controls which uh, feature they pay attention to in this setup, which is just super cool. And as per usual, I didn't realize that I had done slides that go over what I just said out loud, but if you are someone who likes to have the physical written text, this is talking about the predictions that I doodled on the previous slides um, of what we would expect if quality or location were controlling this situation, and then what we actually observe. Um, so those slides are all what I just did manually, but in slide format. So if you want those, they're the exact same thing, just cleaner than my scribbles. Okay, so let's do the conclusions 
along with the actual slides rather than running off on my own again, but this tells us that spatial responses, that discrimination between right versus left, come under the control of a spatial location cue, which kind of makes sense. And quality responses of choosing to make a behavioral response or not come under the control of the quality cue, where we're looking at the quality of the stimulus. So again, it kind of makes sense where some stimuli and responses seem to go together. So this relates to our previous feature that we looked at where the type of response can also be um, in, uh, a, an important factor in terms of our stimulus control. Same with the type of reinforcer. So all of these things, the more related they are, the easier it is for that thing to be learned or for that association to be learned. Now that we're done with talking about features that can be involved in stimulus control, we're going to talk a little bit more about learning and stimulus control. So we're specifically going to pay attention to discrimination and generalization again. So as a reminder, discrimination is responding differentially to two different stimuli. And generalization would be failure to discriminate between two stimuli. So for the discrimination side of things, the individual needs to be able to detect and perceive a difference between those two stimuli, but what the individual has learned about those stimuli is also important. So as we said earlier, it's more than just being capable of perceiving it. There's also other factors that must be considered. So we can talk about stimulus discrimination training, which is some kind of setup that makes uh, organisms more capable of discriminating between two kinds of stimuli. And this can apply to both instrumental and classical conditioning. So we can set it up in terms of a CS plus and a CS minus if we were looking at classical conditioning. So something like an eye blink response, or we could look at instrumental conditioning, which is mostly what we've talked about so far in this chapter, where we have an S plus, an S plus being a stimulus that if we respond in its presence, we would get some kind of reinforcement. You'll also see this called an SD or a discriminative stimulus, but this is just something like um, a, a pigeon being trained to peck a key in the presence of a one kilohertz tone. That one kilohertz tone would be an S plus because it's telling the pigeon that if they peck while that tone is on, they would receive food. We would also have the converse, which is an S minus, or sometimes called an S delta. And this is a stimulus that tells the organism that if they did that behavior now, they wouldn't receive reinforcement. So if the pigeon is trained uh, with an S plus of one kilohertz, then maybe a higher or a lower pitch tone might be trained so that they don't uh, they don't respond to it, or if they respond to it, they don't get reinforcement. So an S minus is a tone that isn't the one they were trained on. And we can have specific stimulus discrimination training where we can teach them that other particular frequencies are for sure S minuses. We can also train them that specific CS minuses are in fact CS minuses if we're looking at the classical conditioning aspect. Um, but by having extra training for stimulus discrimination, we can make sure that they respond more to the thing that they're being trained to respond to, and they respond less to the things that they're not being trained to respond to because we're explicitly training them not to respond to it. Now that is a lot of information to throw at you here, so um, we're going to go over a couple of examples as we get through the rest of the chapter, so don't panic if it hasn't completely clicked quite yet. Now we've talked about the fact that generalization exists, where we can have generalization gradients that are either very shallow or very, very steep, telling us there are different levels of generalization occurring. Um, but we haven't really talked about why people think that that generalization exists. And there are two major theories that we're going to talk about. The first was the original, where Pavlov thought that generalization was caused by a similarity of 
uh, some stimulus to the original stimulus. So if the dogs start salivating when you ring a bell, then maybe if you ring a slightly higher pitched bell, the dog would continue to salivate because that new bell is similar in some quality to the original conditioned stimulus. So from Pavlov's view, he, he thought that what you've learned about that original CS would transfer to other similar stimuli. So learning transfers from one to the other. In contrast, Lashley and Wade said that generalization reflects an absence of learning. So from their perspective, generalization was the natural state, and in fact, stimulus control needed to be learned in order to occur. So if you haven't learned to discriminate yet, then your behavior would look more like generalization because you haven't learned that discrimination yet. And this is actually closer to the truth in terms of what we observe when looking at generalization and discrimination and how it's learned. So even though Pavlov's theory got us started down this path, um, it, that idea isn't very accurate, at least as far as we understand it today. So we're going to continue on with this idea that generalization reflects an absence of learning. And so we're going to talk about how we can learn to discriminate. So we know that if you are discriminating, that you're showing stimulus control. And we can use discrimination training and different kinds of discrimination training to affect the amount of stimulus control. So once we understand what it is that we're learning, we can kind of play around with our training setups to make sure that we're learning what we want to learn. And we can use our generalization gradient to determine the degree of stimulus control, or how much we've learned. So these generalization gradients can be used to answer the question of how precise is the control that our S plus, or CS plus if we're looking at classical conditioning, acquires over the behavior. So just as a reminder, S plus is for instrumental behavior, and a CS plus would be for a classical conditioning behavior. So if we want to figure out how precise our uh, stimulus control is, we would need to start by determining which feature or features of the discrimination procedure is controlling the gradient that we see in our generalization gradient. We want to look at how steep the generalization gradient is when tested with stimuli that systematically differ from our S+. So this graph is showing an actual uh, discrimination procedure or discrimination training. And so we have different setups that show different generalization gradients. So if we start by looking at our open squares here, this is a setup where our S plus is a 1000 hertz tone and our S minus is no tone. So we could consider this a pigeon in an operant box who they, if they peck a key while the 1000 hertz tone is playing, then they receive reinforcement. If the tone is not playing, that's the S minus scenario. And if they peck the key during that period, there's no reinforcement given. So they learn that pecking the key to 1000 hertz gets them food, and if there is no tone, then there is no food available. Our next group here that we're going to look at are our closed rectangles, and these, uh, it's the same basic setup for an S+, plus, where they are trained that if they peck when a 1000 hertz tone plays, then they get reinforcement, they get access to food, but now our S minus is actually a different kind of tone. So it's not just a lack of tone, now it's a 950 hertz tone. So this is telling them specifically that if you peck at this specific frequency, you get food, and if you peck at this other frequency, then you don't get food. So our first example, where it's a discrimination between a tone and no tone, that's an interdimensional uh, discrimination, where you're telling the difference between a tone and a lack of tone. And what we see in the graph here, I'm going to just draw over the lines to make it a little bit more visible, is that they do respond more at that 1000 hertz. 
we see that they do have more responding to that particular frequency. But we also see that this line, this curve, is fairly broad, where they're still going to respond at least a little bit to frequencies that are a little bit lower and a little bit higher. So they're still showing some responding, they're showing some generalization. If we look at the closed square group, um, where they're being reinforced for responding to a specific frequency and they're not being reinforced for responding to another frequency, this is an intra-dimensional discrimination. So they're making a discrimination within one particular dimension. So it's not uh, a tone versus no tone. This is one frequency of a tone versus another specific frequency of the tone. And that's this curve here where because of their S minus training, any frequency that is um, close to that 1000 hertz uh, is going to have much less responding. So our discrimination gradient is a lot narrower here. We're seeing a lot less generalization and more discrimination because they respond very, very little to frequencies lower than 1000 hertz. And we even see less responding to frequencies slightly higher than 1000 hertz. And we still see the highest responding is right around that 1000 hertz point. So we're still seeing a response response peak that corresponds to our S plus, but the presence of this S minus and the fact that it's an intradimensional discrimination, uh, intra instead of inter, this is forcing that curve to be a little bit narrow. And then we can also look at our last group, which is our control group, where they received no discrimination training. And uh, let's grab a, I guess, a different color. And that's this line here, which is pretty much flat, where they respond pretty much equally to any frequency that's being presented. And that's because they had no S plus or S minus training. So this is just full discrimination, or sorry, full generalization, where they aren't peaking at one particular frequency. Um, it's just there. And though the textbook focuses on a very narrow range of different kinds of discriminative stimuli, they spend a lot of time talking about uh, frequencies of sound and light, so telling the difference between different sounds, uh, pitches of sounds, different colors of light. Um, the textbook also seems to have a strange fascination with being able to tell the difference between concentrations of cocaine. I don't quite know why there were so many cocaine-based experiments in this chapter, but apparently that's something else that's been studied pretty thoroughly. But I've also tried to introduce some other things like landmarks and spatial things and paying attention to if something is in front of or behind you. So this should give you the idea that the range of different discriminative stimuli is fairly broad and you can test these different kinds of discriminate, discriminative stimuli in lots of different ways. So it doesn't just have to be tones in a box. You can expand upon it. Can uh, organisms tell the different between, difference between different kinds of music? Um, auditory frequencies we covered. There's, of course, the painting styles uh, discriminations. Can they tell the difference between geometric shapes, medical slides, etc.? And a lot of these examples come straight from the pigeon literature, which I absolutely love looking at if ever I have spare time, because you can set up discrimination studies to assess the sensory capacity of many, many different species, and you can discriminate all sorts of types of stimuli. So we're going to very, very briefly look at some of the cool stuff they've had pigeons discriminate. The first of which is, can they tell the difference between Picasso and Monet paintings? So you can train one group of pigeons to respond to Picasso paintings. So the presence of a Picasso painting would become an S plus, and the presence of a Monet painting would become an S minus. Um, and then you can test them with new Picasso and Monet paintings and say, did they learn that Picasso-like paintings should be responded to and Monet-like paintings should not be responded to? And in fact, pigeons are very, very good at figuring this out. 
some other really cool stuff that pigeons can tell the difference between uh, is if you show them scans of cell tissue, they can be trained to recognize the difference between healthy and cancerous cells. Pigeons can tell the difference between lots of different kinds of artists. They've been trained to tell the difference between pictures that have people in them versus pictures that don't have people, uh, pictures that are natural versus containing artificial buildings or something like that. There are all sorts of really cool discriminations that can be done. Um, and this is why I like looking at pigeon research because they can test whatever they can think of, and pigeons seem to be really, really good at visual discriminations. Next, we're going to talk about uh, researcher Spence and how their theories relate to discrimination learning. So in the 1930s, Spence proposed that animals learned about both the S pluses and S minuses, where what they learn about an S plus would be something to do with excitation and an S minus would be to do with inhibition. So when there's an S plus, you learn that you should make a response. And when there's an S minus, you learn that you should not make a response. Um, and that's because when the S plus is present, you get reinforced. And when the S minus is present, you do not get reinforced. So the reinforcement of a response in the presence of our S plus leads to excitatory conditioning. And non-reinforcement of the response during our S minus leads to inhibitory conditioning. And from this, we could say that the outward effect that we observed is differential responding because of conditioned excitation to the S plus and conditioned inhibition to the S minus. Now we know that individuals respond less to S minuses, but an S minus doesn't have to be specifically inhibitory to elicit less responding. But the basic idea here is that we would actually have two generalization gradients that operate in behind what we actually observe. So we would have an excitatory stimulus generalization gradient and an inhibitory stimulus generalization gradient. And the net outcome of those two gradients overlapped should give us what we actually observe when we measure responding. And we can conduct tests of stimulus generalization with stimuli that vary systematically. So kind of the same process we've already talked about, but now we can be looking for these specific types of generalization gradients that might be lurking in the background. So let's look at an experiment that starts picking apart this idea in behind our generalization gradients. I do want to point out before we get started that the uh, symbols here were actually reversed for whatever reason. Um, when I swapped things over from my rough slides to these slides, it changed black to white and white to black. So um, make sure that you correct your slides or at least make a mental note of it because otherwise it gets very, very confusing. Um, but we're going to start with our solid black squares at the top, which are a situation with an S plus of 550 and no S minus. So this is a wavelength, so this is a specific color. Um, same basic ideas, looking at frequencies of sounds, but now we're looking at wavelengths of colors. And so this group is given only an excitatory stimulus. There's only an S plus, and they're reinforced for uh, going or responding to this S plus. So if they make an operant response when this S plus is present, they get reinforced. And so we see a peak of responding at that particular frequency. As I said, there is no S minus. So this is only an excitatory generalization gradient because there is no S minus present. So any changes that we see to this responding, once we start introducing our S minuses, can be considered due to an inhibitory generalization gradient that's operating in the background. So let's see what happens when we look at these other situations. So next we have our S plus is still 550 in all three groups. They have the same S plus. The only thing that's differing here is our S minus. This open squares group introduces an S minus of 590. So our S minus is going to be over here, quite a ways away from our S plus. And what we observe is this unique 
little shift where the highest responding is no longer occurring at the 550 where our S plus was. They're still having fairly high responding to the S plus, but by introducing this S minus here on the right side, we see that our peak, our point of highest responding, scoots to the left just a little bit. So it's almost like they're trying to make sure that they don't respond to the thing that they know won't be reinforced, and as a result are kind of overcompensating by responding on this left side here a little bit more than they probably should. And so what happens is if we introduce an S minus that's even closer to our S plus, we introduce an S minus at 555, where our S plus is 550, so right next to it here, we can look at our new curve, which is the one with the uh, open circles here. This is, I'm just gonna trace over it so it's a little bit clearer because this graph turns messy. We see an even bigger shift over to the side here. So um, the S minus is added on the right and we see a shift to the left where their responding is um, on the opposite side of where the S minus is from our S plus. So the peak should be in the middle here according to our excitatory curve, but because of the inhibitory curve introduced by our S minus, we see a shift um, over to the left there. Oops. Wrong way. And because of this shift, we see very, very little responding at our S plus wavelength. So even though this is the wavelength that's been reinforced that they were trained to respond to, we see very, very little responding here. And in fact, we see our most responding is, again, off to the left here. And this weird phenomena that we're observing is called peak shift effect. And that's because the peak the highest point of responding has shifted from on top of our S minus, or sorry, on top of our S plus frequency, and is now shifted in the opposite direction to get away from our S minus. So instead of responding the most to our S plus, when an S minus is introduced, that peak of responding, that highest rate of responding occurs somewhere other than our S plus, where we would have expected to see that peak. So get rid of my doodles here. So coming back to Spence and this idea of an overlapping S plus gradient and S minus gradient, they expected that we would see something kind of like this, where our S plus gradient or our uh, S plus would mark that peak, that point where we should see the highest responding. So we see our excitatory um, discrimination curve or uh, generalization curve. We see our S minus down here, which would be the lowest point or the point of least responding for our inhibitory curve. So our uh, excitation develops around our S plus, so the highest responding is that S plus. Inhibition develops around the S minus, the lowest point of responding is that S minus, and the peak shift should be the net effect of these two generalization gradients. So if we add them together and average out what uh, we're seeing here, we get something that looks like this, where because of this negative curve underneath, we see less responding at the S plus and that peak shift occurs. S minus is still going to be a fairly low point of responding because that's such a negative point here. But we just average the two lines together and get something that looks like this. Okay, so that's us talking about discrimination training. What about the opposite? What if we want to encourage generalization? We could have equivalence training, which is the opposite of discrimination training, where we actually encourage generalization. So if you wanted to train animals to generalize, then you can treat dissimilar stimuli as similar, tell them that these stimuli are equivalent. So we can develop stimulus equivalence where you teach them that these two previously considered dissimilar stimuli are actually the same, they should be treated the same, so they are equivalent. And by doing this, you can train animals to generalize, not discriminate, among stimuli.
A real world example of this stimulus equivalence is teaching a child the category of, say, fruits or vegetables. So you look at a cucumber and a carrot and broccoli, and those all look very, very different. But you call all of them vegetables, so they develop stimulus equivalence because they are all vegetables. So if you asked your kid to circle all of the vegetables that they see on the page of a textbook, then they could uh, generalize and treat all of those very, very different um, items as equivalent because they are all vegetables. We can very, very briefly go over what a basic stimulus equivalence training setup would look like. Um, and in this situation, we would have four different stimuli, A, B, C, and D. These could be four different colored keys. These could be four different frequency sounds. It doesn't really matter. Um, so what we would say is that um, A and B, if you get either A or B and make response one, then you get food. So we could say, let's go with colors and let's go with different keys. So let's say that you have a key on the left and a key on the right. And on uh, the key on the left, I'm going to write these down because I'm going to forget. Let's say this one's left, this one's right. If we have a blue or a red light come on and you peck left, then you get food. If a green or a yellow light comes on and you peck on the right, then you get food. By having the same response to blue and red and the same response to green and yellow, we start developing that stimulus equivalence. So we establish that A and B are the same, and C and D are the same. We then go through reassignment, where one of those stimuli gets retrained. So now our blue key, A, when that shows up, they have to make response three. Maybe instead of pecking the left or the right, maybe now they have to pull a lever or something else. Um, and if they pull that lever, then they get food. We can also reassign C, which was our green color. And after C, maybe now they have to uh, peck a touch screen. Um, and if they peck that touch screen, then they get food. And if we want to test for stimulus equivalence, we would say, okay, we now know that um, A, if you do response three, then you get food. Because B is the same as A from our initial training, if B occurs, then they should give response three in order to get food because they treat B the same as A. And the same with D, because we retrained C to have response four reinforced, when D is presented, which we haven't trained anything new about it, they should make response four simply because of the equivalence of training, um, because of the association that we made them have with C. So that's the very, very basics of that. And the textbook goes over this a couple of times with a couple of different examples if you want to look at that again. Um, but just to cover it very, very quickly here. The next thing we're going to look at are contextual cues. So this is instead of looking at sort of one isolated S plus or S minus, what if we start looking at the big picture? What if we start looking at the environment or the context in which this behavior is occurring? So we can ask the question of can behavior come under the control of contextual cues? So we'll look at an experiment done by Aikens in the 90s where they had male quail with sexual conditioning. Whenever we talk about quail, it's almost always uh, in relation to sexual conditioning just because it is so easy to train in quail. But in this experiment, they had two different contexts. So uh, an arena with two compartments. One, they had sand on the floor with orange walls and a ceiling, or orange walls and an orange ceiling. So it looked like this. That would be one context. The other context would be a wire mesh floor with green walls and a green ceiling. So these two contexts are very different, and they have lots of different cues in their environment. So the floors are different, the walls are different, the ceilings are different. They are different spaces. 
They set up a baseline to figure out which room the birds preferred to be in, so they were allowed to move back and forth between these um, freely, and they measured their preference. So basically, which room do they spend the most time in, which one do they spend the less time in? And they decided to make the less preferred compartment their CS+, where they would where they would be presented with a sexually receptive female. So we're looking at CS pluses, meaning that it's classical conditioning instead of just an S plus and S minus, which was our instrumental conditioning. But here we would have, um, it's classical conditioning CS plus. So in the experimental group, in that less preferred compartment, the quail would be paired with a sexually receptive female as the unconditioned stimulus in that less preferred compartment. So if given the choice of the orange sandy room or the green meshy room, maybe the quail preferred to spend time in the orange sandy room. So then whenever they were in this green mesh room, they would be given access to a sexually receptive female. They also had a control group where the unconditioned stimulus, the sexually receptive female, was only present in their home cage, so they were never given access to a female in either of these compartments. And so the idea would be that that access to a receptive female in that CS plus environment, in that formerly less preferred compartment, should lead them to prefer that compartment more. So after this training, after they went through the classical uh, classical conditioning, they did some preference tests. So our first preference test would be our baseline when they were allowed to wander freely between the two different contexts. And so this is the percent of time spent in the CS plus compartment. So this is how much time they're spending in their originally not preferred compartment. So obviously they're spending very little time in the compartment that they don't prefer. Then we had our second and third preference tests, which occurred sort of during and after that classical conditioning. Our control uh, quail didn't learn anything new about that context, so they continue to not prefer their unpreferred compartment. But our experimental quail came to spend more time in that CS plus compartment because of that association with the sexually receptive female. So they came to prefer the context that was associated with the female. So we can associate a context or environment instead of just single cues. So that's really, really cool. Now, for the most part, we've been talking about the relationship between two events, our CS and US. Um, we're looking at the direct relationship between our response and our reinforcer. These are all considered binary relations because there are only two factors being considered. But sometimes this relation between the two events can be signaled by a third stimulus, which we can call a modulator. So a modulator is a third event that occurs in addition to the CSUS or response reinforcer. Now this modulator can help in discriminating that binary relation. So uh, the context of rooms in that male quail sexual conditioning experiment, in that situation, the floor, the walls, the ceiling could all serve as modulators that let them know um, what situation they were in. For discrimination training, our S pluses and S minuses are modulators that signal the relationship between our response and reinforcer. So these modulators are facilitators or occasion setters in Pavlovian conditioning experiments. So we'll very briefly talk about an experiment that shows the um, how modulators can affect behavior. So here we're going to use light as a modulator. Now this is going to be in a classical conditioning or Pavlovian conditioning setup. So when the light is on, when a, uh, so yeah, when a light is on, if a tone plays, that tone will be followed by the delivery of food. So our conditioned stimulus is a tone, our unconditioned stimulus is the delivery of food. And what we're measuring on our graph here is the number of times that a mouse pokes their head into the hole where the food is delivered. If the light is on, that tone is followed by food. 
If the light is off, that tone is not followed by food. So what we would expect is if they learn that the light has modulating qualities, that we will see more head pokes when the light is on and the tone plays than if the light is off and the tone plays. And in fact, that is what we see here. So if the tone, which is this noise, N plus, so the tone plays while the light is on, we see the highest rate of head pokes. And in the other situations where either the light is off or the tone is not played, we see lower rates of responding or lower behaviors of looking for food that might have been delivered. So these, uh, this light had come to be a modulator in this situation. All right, that is the end of a very long chapter. So a quick breakdown of our chapter eight summary. Stimulus discrimination and generalization is something that we use every day. And it's uh, involved in all sorts of different behaviors that we see in our everyday lives, from knowing whether to walk or not walk at a crosswalk, to knowing the difference between your cell phone ringing and someone else's cell phone ringing. We can use generalization gradients to determine the amount of stimulus control that's going on. We know that steeper gradients mean more control is going on. We also talked about many factors that affect stimulus control. And it's important to consider all of these factors when you're designing experiments and when you're interpreting the results of other experiments. And with all that we know about these uh, discrimination and generalization setups, we can make use of these to learn how different animals perceive their worlds. Are they capable of seeing this? Are they capable of telling the difference between these things? What features do they treat similarly and which ones do they treat differently? Um, so lots and lots of information covered in this chapter.